Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, Called for a Crisis, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse by verse, because this would take uh, at least the rest of this year, but uh, we want to take it in certain sections of the book that will capture the thought and message of this great prophecy and bring it before our minds and hearts. There's much to learn from Jeremiah. I've come to love this book greatly, and I think you will too. I'm afraid to ask how many are familiar with the book of Jeremiah. I, I, I know that Jeremiah is not the greatest of the prophets. Isaiah, I think, would claim that title. Nor is this the most difficult of the prophets to understand. I think Ezekiel would probably be that one. But surely Jeremiah is the most heroic of all the prophets. For this young man began his ministry in the days of Josiah, the king of Judah. And for 42 years he preached in Judah and tried to turn the nation around and tried to awaken it to what was about to happen to it and to save it from the judgment of God. And in all those 42 years, never once did he see any sign of encouragement. Never did he alter for one moment the headlong course of this nation to its own destruction. Never did he see any sign that what he was saying had any impact at all upon these people. And yet he was faithful to his task. And through much personal sorrow and struggle and heartache and and difficulty and danger, he uh, performed what God had sent him to do and left a tremendous record of the of the of the greatness of God, of the uh, power of God over nations and the control of God of history and of the hope that arises out of darkness. I've chosen this series of studies because it's set in the time of crisis and moral decline in a nation. It reveals what is behind the death of a nation. In two years, the United States of America will celebrate its 200th birthday. And it may be that in these very days, when we celebrate our bicentennial as a nation, we also may be uh, witnesses to the to the beginning of the end of the United States of America. There are some who feel that way. I hope it isn't true. But the same forces that are destroying our nation are the forces that destroyed the nation that Jeremiah witnessed to. Same forces. And we can learn a great deal about what is going on in a national life by this great prophecy of Jeremiah. We can learn here how to behave in a time of national and personal crisis. What should a believer do when things are falling apart around him, in his home, in his community, in his nation, in the world in which he lives? And from this prophecy also we'll learn what is the word of hope in an hour of despair and darkness, and how God plants the seeds of uh, new life in the midst of death and destruction all around. And it's a great book, and I'm sure we're going to uh, reap great benefits as we go through this book together. Now this morning, in chapter 1, we have a full-length portrait in this opening chapter of the prophet and the times in which he lived. Uh, The first three verses set the prophecy according to its historical background. We read the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of uh, of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now that's a bare-bones description of the circumstances and the times in which Jeremiah ministered. 
and it doesn't give us much uh, of a flavor of these days. But these were troublous times in the nation. Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been carried into captivity by Assyria a hundred years before this. Now Judah, the southern kingdom, was rushing headlong on a course that was certain to lead it to the same judgment. And Josiah, the last good and godly king of Israel, has, or of Judah, has come to the throne. And Je Jeremiah was born and began to minister in his days. The prophecy of Jeremiah is a collection of his, of his uh, messages interspersed with certain historical narrative that sets the base background of it. It doesn't proceed chronologically. If you try to read through Jeremiah and uh, follow it through chronologically, you'll end in confusion. Uh, it jumps about from here to there and back and forth in time. And it's necessary, if you pursue it chronologically, to, to piece it together to understand it. But the message... There's a moral progress through the book that is uh, very uh, orderly, and it's that that we'll follow through. Began in the days of Josiah, ended in the days of his son, Zedekiah, the, the last king of Judah, and finally the exile of Judah under the Babylonians. And uh, you'll notice that we're introduced to the fact that Jeremiah is a priest and the son of a priest. He was what we would call today a PK, a preacher's kid. And he grew up in a priestly town, a town where only the priests lived, Anathoth, one of the cities of Benjamin, uh, not far from the city of Jerusalem. And his father's name was Hilkiah. Now, Hilkiah is a very common name. Uh, we're not certain just which Hilkiah this is. But it's interesting that the, there was a, the high priest in the days of Josiah was a priest named Hilkiah. And uh, the book of Kings tells us that this priest was rummaging around in one of the rooms of the temple one day. And uh, down underneath a, a lot of dusty records and legend, uh, ledgers and so on, he found a scroll and he brought it out. And to his amazement, he began to read it. He discovered it was a copy of the law of Moses. The, law, the nation had fallen so far that the law had actually been lost and forgotten. And this priest, Hilkiah, found the law and read it. And he was stunned by what he read. He took it to the king, Josiah, and Josiah read the law. And he, too, was absolutely uh, 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 stunned and uh, astonished by what he read, feeling that the nation was under the judgment of God. And he began, therefore, the reform that was to be the last national reform that this nation experienced before its exile. This may have been Jeremiah's father. Some scholars think he was, some are not so sure. But at least he did bear the same name as Hilkiah. At any rate, Jeremiah began his ministry under Josiah the king in the days when Josiah was trying desperately to set the kingdom right and had uh, moved with great authority and power to tear down the idols and to restore the worship of Jehovah and to cause the newfound law to be read to the people that they might hear the words of God. But the reform was merely transitory and temporary, and as soon as the king died, it all fell, died back again. Jeremiah lived to see Jehoahaz, who is uh, Josiah's son, rule for three months, and then to be captured by Egypt and carried down to Egypt as an exile. He watched Assyria's might up in the north being crushed by the power of Babylon, and later Egypt itself was humbled at the Battle of Carchemish, which is one of the strategic battles of all time in 605 B.C. And Jeremiah saw the total domination of the world by Babylon uh, under Nebuchadnezzar and at last the invasion of his own beloved land of Judah by the Babylonian armies, the surrounding of Jerusalem, the siege of the city, 
the overthrow of it and the carrying away into exile, Babylonian captivity of the people of Judah. Jeremiah at last was left in a desolated land, a land that had just been utterly ravaged by war. And then betrayed by politicians, he was uh, taken down as a captive to Egypt, and there in Egypt he died unknown, unhonored, and unsung. And tradition tells us he was stoned to death by the very Jews whom he trusted as his brothers who had taken him down to the land. Here's a man then that knew nothing of the outward encouragement of success. Nothing at all. Never saw his prophecies of healing and health fulfilled in this land. And yet, despite all this, he was absolutely faithful faithful to the to the call of God. And the heroism and courage of this man is tremendously uh, remarkable to behold. This book has become a, an encouraging thing to my own heart. Now in the next few verses, verses 4 through 10, you have the call of Jeremiah by God. And it's a remarkable account of how God prepared and sent this young man into a ministry. It's all God's work. God does the calling. He does the preparing. He he provides the power. It's all of God. Notice this now as you look at it. Verse 4, the preparation of God. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. Isn't it remarkable that when God began to talk to this young man, and send him to his ministry, the first thing he did was to sit down and share with him the four spiritual laws. (laughs) At least the first one. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. (laughs) Then what he said? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. This is the preparation of God. And the remarkable thing is that this preparation began long before Jeremiah was even conceived. In other words, God says, I started getting you ready and ready and the world ready for you long before you were born. I worked through your father and your mother, your grandfathers and your grandmothers your great-grandfathers and your great-grandmothers. For generations back, I've been preparing you. What a remarkable revelation to this young man that through the generations of the past, God had begun to work. You know, when men face a crisis, they always start looking for a program. They start looking for some method to attack the crisis with. When God sets about to solve a a crisis, he almost always starts with a baby. Isn't that interesting? All the babies God sends into the world that look so innocent and so useless and helpless at their birth. This morning after the 8.30 service, Bill and Joan Tankersley brought their new son Stephen up to me and showed him to me. And he looks like any other baby. I didn't say that to them. But there's nothing very impressive about a baby. But that's God's way of changing the world, is to prepare a baby. And what's hidden in the heart of a baby is the most amazing thing. That's what God said to the, to, about Jeremiah. I've been working before you were born to prepare you to be a prophet through your father and your mother and those who, go behi- who are behind them. History tells us that that uh, the mother of uh, uh, Sir Walter Scott loved poetry and art. It was no wonder that Sir Walter Scott followed his mother's loves in this way. The mother of Lord Byron was hot-tempered and proud and violent. The mother of Napoleon Bonaparte was ambitious for herself and for her children. The mother of John and Charles Wesley was a godly, devout woman with great executive ability. 
And having 19 children, she had to have it. <laughs> but God prepares for a child long before that child is born. Now, if you read this account as though this is something extraordinary that applied only to Jeremiah the prophet, you've misread this whole passage. I often hear people say of some noted person, well, when God made him, he broke the mold. <laughs> and that's true. When God made Abraham Lincoln, he broke the mold. There's never been another one like him. But what we fail to see is that that's true of every single one of, the, of us. There's nothing unusual about that. God never made another one like you, and he never will again. God's never made anybody else that can fill and do the things that you can do. And this is the wonder of God's uh, forming of human life, is that there in the billions and billions who have been spawned out upon this earth, there are, there are no duplicates. Everyone is unique, prepared of God for the time in which you and I live. That's the word that came to Jeremiah to strengthen him. Look, look God said, I have prepared you for this very hour in history. As he's prepared you and you and you and I for this time in this uh, world and for this hour of human history where we are. Each of us is therefore both uh, the goal toward which God has been working and at once the preparation of someone yet to come behind us. And we have a part in their working. I heard this week uh, a story concerning the death of a young man whom some of you have known, David Kraft, who was the pastor of the Scotts Valley Baptist Church. His father is Dr. Roy Kraft of the Twin Lakes Baptist Church in, in Santa Cruz. His uncle is our dear friend, Dr. Ralph Kraft, here in Los Altos. And when David Kraft was dying of cancer just a few weeks ago, his father and his uncle came to see him. They're twin brothers. They came to see him. And David visited with him a bit, and then he said to his uncle, would you mind if I talk to my dad alone? And his uncle was glad to slip out in the hall and wait. And he was there for a while. And then his brother, Roy, David's father, came out and joined him. And they went down and had a cup of coffee. And Roy Kraft said to his brother, I want to tell you what David did while you were gone out of the room. He said he called me over. And he said, uh, can I put my arms around you? And I stooped over him as best I could and let him put his arms around me. And he says, and now, Dad, will you put your arms around me? And he said, I could hardly keep my control, but he said, I put my arms around him. And then he said, with his arms around me, he said, Dad, I just want you to know that the greatest gift God ever gave me outside of salvation was the gift of a father and mother who loved God and taught me to love him too. Now that's what God is saying to Jeremiah. What a gift you have. How I've prepared you for this moment and prepared you through the generations that lie behind you that you might speak and live and act and be in this time in history. And then there's not only the preparation of God but the provision of God. In verses 6 and on, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak. For I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Jeremiah's response was to shrink from the call of God. Many a young man has done that before him. This is what Moses did, Remember? And uh, Gideon and others, Isaiah, other mighty men of God, when God first laid hold of them and sent them to a task, they shrank from it. And Jeremiah pleads youth and inexperience and uh, says he can't speak, inability to speak, just as Moses did. 
So if you ever feel that way when God calls you to a task, just remember that you're in the prophetic succession. God's men often start out that way. And this is what Jeremiah did. As best we can tell, he was about 30 years old at this time. That's when young men began their ministry in Israel, Judah. 30 years old. Now that's over the hill to the modern youth. That's beyond the time when anybody can do anything, according to them. But that's when God starts. Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. And yet Jeremiah feels his inadequacy and his inexperience and his inability. And this, I think, marks the sensitivity of this young man. Throughout this whole prophecy, you'll find him very responsive and sensitive to what's happening to him. He's called to stand before kings, to thunder denunciations and judgments, to feel the sharp lash of their recrimination against him, to suffer under their anger and their power, and to suffer with his people as he sees them uh, he rushing headlong to their own self-destruction. And uh, he feels it keenly and sharply. He weeps and laments. The book of Lamentations is made up of the cries of his heart as he senses all that's happening to him. Jeremiah was a very sensitive young man and a very sensitive prophet. But God's answer to him is always what it has been to every other young man who felt this way. His answer is, go for I am with you. I will be with you. Don't worry about your voice, your looks, your personality, your ability. I will be with you. I'll be your voice. I'll speak through you. I'll give you the words. I'll give you the power to stand. I'll give you the courage. I'll be your wisdom. I'll be whatever you need. Whatever your de de demand is made upon you, I'll be there to meet it. Now you and I recognize that that's essentially the new covenant that Jesus makes with all of us. This is what he promises each one of us, that he'll be with us in this same way. And the same promise that encouraged Jeremiah is the promise that's handed out to you and to me in the gospel. That wherever we are, whatever demand is made upon us, don't be afraid. Don't shrink back. Don't say, I can't do that. Remember, God says, I will be with you. And I'll make you able to do it. And so you see in the third division of this call, the power of God is promised. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah was like Isaiah. God touched his mouth. Remember, Isaiah started this same way. God sent the coals from the altar and touched his mouth and gave him a power in speaking. And Isaiah was given the same one. And Jeremiah's word then becomes the key to his power from here on, for it's the word of God, the living, burning, mighty, breaking power of the word of God. He was set over nations and kingdoms. Now, this was no mere uh, poetry. Actually, the messages of this book are addressed to all the nations of the world of that day to Egypt and to Syria, to Babylon in its towering might and strength. And the, uh, Jeremiah was given a word for all these nations. I like to think of this scene because I think it's so often repeated in every generation. Here are the nations of the world with their obvious display of power and pomp and circumstance with the statesmen and the leaders that are well-known, household names in every place and uh, threatening one another and, uh, and uh, uh, marching up and down and rattling their sabers and acting so proud and so, uh, so uh, assertive in themselves. But God picks out an obscure little young man, youth, 
30 years of age, who nobody knows about, never heard of, from a little tiny town in a little obscure, tiny, hidden country. And he says, look, I have set you over all the nations and the kingdoms of the earth. Your word, because it's my word, will have more power than all the power of the nations. And I think that's a remarkable description of what has, is our, our heritage as Christians in Jesus Christ. Remember James says, the prayer of a righteous man releases great power. And when you and I pray about the affairs of life and of nations, we can turn the course of nations as the word of Jeremiah altered the destiny of nations of his day. When we preach and proclaim the truth of God, even though we're obscure and no one knows about us, that word has power to change the course of nations. And this could be documented if we had time throughout the course of human history. So Jeremiah was set in the midst of death and destruction, but in the midst of it God said he would plant a hope and a healing. His word would destroy. Your, my word, he said, is given to you to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow. And that's always the work of God. In a nation, there are many things that have to be torn down, many things that men trust in. In a human being's life, an individual's heart and life, there are things that need to be destroyed. I talked with a young man not long ago about his marriage. And he said to me, I don't understand what's wrong with my marriage. He said, I've, I'm doing everything that I know to do. But he says, our relationship isn't right. And uh, there seems to be so something wrong that I can't put my finger on. And I said to him, yes, I'm sure there is. And God will show it to you. There are things in your marriage that you're doing that you're not aware of, that you need to see. And right now you're blind to them. You, you, you can't see them. And so you think everything is right, and yet it's not right, and that puzzles you. And all it indicates is that there are things that God still needs to tear down and break down. Points of pride, moments of uh, discourtesy perhaps that you don't recognize, habits of reaction, of worry and anxiety and anger and frustration that you've fallen into that you give way to and you don't even know about them. And the work of God is to open your eyes to them and break these things down and destroy them and root them out. And then always to build and to plant. God never destroys for the purpose of destroying. He, build, he destroys in order that he might build up again. This was God's call to Jeremiah. Now the closing section is the ministry of this young man in the land. And it uh, uh, falls briefly into three major divisions here, beginning with verse 11. First, there are certain symbols of what would be accomplished through this young man's ministry. The first one is in verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a rod of almond, that is a branch of the almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Now there's a little play on words here in Hebrew. The Hebrews called the almond tree the watcher because it was the first tree to bloom in the spring. And it, uh, they, they, they saw it as watching for the return of the sun and the warming of the earth. And therefore it was the first one to herald the coming of the springtime. And so they called it the watcher. That's the name of the Hebrew word for almond, the watcher. And uh, God said to Jeremiah, you've seen well because that's what I'm doing. I'm watching over my word to perform it. And this is a picture of health and healing. And throughout this prophecy, there are some tremendous sections that deal with the way God was planning to heal this land. Jeremiah was sent down uh, to buy a piece of property in the midst of destruction. When the city was being taken by the enemy, he was sent down to buy some property and to take get the title deed and seal it and uh, have it uh, witnessed. 
as a testimony, a witness to the fact that God intended to restore that land and that property would be of value. That title would have value yet. This is what God does constantly in our lives. This would be one of the works of Jeremiah. Then there was a second symbol. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord, and they shall come and every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against its walls round about and against all the cities of Judah. He saw a pot that was boiling with the smoke and steam coming up and being driven by a north wind. The, the steam was streaming toward the south. And God said, Jeremiah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring a boiling pot of nations, a collection of nations down from the north against this city of Jerusalem. As once again, he's going to do that in history, perhaps very soon. And the city shall be taken and driven into exile, and my judgment shall fall upon this land. This was the picture of, of judgment. And uh, it would come from the north. Egypt was the greatest power of the day at this time, but Egypt is ignored in this. God seizes upon Babylon as the source from which the judgment would come. And then he announces the cause of that judgment. Verse 16, And I will utter my judgments against them, for all their wickedness in forsaking me, they have burned incense to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Now that's the reason why a nation dies. It forsakes its God. And it evidences it by doing two things. By burning incense before other gods. That is by exalting philosophies and ideas that represent various uh, uh, controlling passions and thoughts of men and, uh, and building them up and exalting them, burning incense before them and by worshiping the works of its own hands, that is by exalting man and uh, pointing to man as the solution to his own problems. By a rise of humanism, these are the signs of decay in a nation. This is what was happening in Israel. In the very first uh, prophecy of Jeremiah to Judah, in chapter 2, verse 13, he says, For my people have committed two evils, God says. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What a picture. Here's a valley with a stream running through it. Beautiful mountain stream with clear, cool, clean water. And the people have been drinking from that water. But after a while they forsake it and up on the hillsides, the barren rocky hillsides, they hew out cisterns to catch the water that runs down from the mountainside with its dirt and its leaves and its, and, uh, its collection of uh, dead mice and other things. And the cisterns leak. They won't hold the water. And so they're constantly at great expense building cisterns that break in the, in the drought, let the water run out, and they have nothing to drink, while the stream of living water runs fresh in the valley below. What a picture that is. A lot of people do that, don't they? Turn from the God who is able to bring the freshness and vitality of joy and peace and love into a life, and start seeking it out in all kinds of dead human philosophies and... Uh, uh, other sources, friendships, pleasures, whatever they may be, these broken cisterns that can hold no water. That's when a nation and a home and an individual begins to die. But in the midst of it, the final promise to Jeremiah is, but you gird up your loins, arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its princes, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. 
For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. I remember when I was a boy, 16 years old in high school, I was arrested once. I was served a warrant for my arrest because it was claimed, and wrongly it was proved, that I had been hunting uh, out of season. But I remember yet how fearsome a thing it was to receive that warrant for my arrest and to open up and read these words. The people of the state of Montana versus Ray C. Stedman. I thought, what unfair odds. The whole people of the state of Montana against me. And that's what this prophet Jeremiah had to face. All the people of the land, its kings, its priests, would all be against him. But God said, don't you worry. You shall stand. I'll make you a stone, an iron, and a bronze against them. And nothing will shake you. And the amazing thing is, though this young man was thrown into prison, though he was put in a dungeon where he was mired in the mud and put on a bread and water diet, though he was isolated and ostracized and set aside and rejected and insulted and finally exiled into Egypt, never once when God asked him to speak did he ever fail to say the thing God told him to say. Remarkable courage this young man. And yet through all of it, he learned four things. He learned the sovereignty of God, his control over the nations of earth. He learned the ruthlessness of God. His judgments would be unmerciful against his people who persisted in turning away from him. He learned the faithfulness of God to always fulfill his word no matter what was said. And finally, he learned to suffer with the heart of God, the tenderness of God. This man suffered. He wept. He lost hope for a while. And he cried out, oh, that I had never been born. He felt the awful hurt of his people and wept over them with tears. And in it all, he realized he was but feeling the suffering of the heart of God over people who turn him aside and the tenderness of God that draws them back at last, despite all their wondering. Well, that's the prophecy of Jeremiah. I hope we'll enjoy it as we go through it and learn much for the hour of our own national peril. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we pray that you will find the secret of the courage of this young man to stand in the day of national danger and disaster, and to be faithful to his calling. Help us to learn, Lord, how to do this. Thank you for the preparation that you've given us through the generations that have gone before us. And now, Lord, may we pass that on to the generations that follow, that they may stand and be faithful. In the name of Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, we pray. Amen.